listening to episode 142 of My Life Radio. I am your host, Matt Blackburn, and today we're speaking with Amanda Christian, and the focus is gut health. And this is really fascinating to me because it seems like most people have digestive issues, and there's such an overload of information out there about what you should do if you have gas or bloating or constipation. Everyone has their own opinion and advice of how you should come back to balance. What I like about Amanda is that she simplifies it and she shares really easy practical tips that you can implement. And she had a journey similar to mine where she had to unlearn what she'd been taught in the alternative health sphere and learn about PUFAs and estrogen and iron overload and lipofuscin, which he talks about a little bit, called brown bowel disease. So let's jump in. Here is Amanda Christian. All right, Amanda Christian, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for uh, coming on and sharing your, your journey and wisdom and knowledge about gut health. This is a subject that it seems like everyone's so confused. And um, I remember when I got into health, I learned about uh, serotonin and how, you know, most of that's produced in the gut and mm -hmm. how health starts in the gut. And I've since kind of expanded on that, um, connecting more dots. I think gut health's important, but it's not like the only thing to focus on, right? Like a lot of people do. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not the only, but that's usually the place that I start with um, any client or, you know, someone just coming to me with questions. I usually start with gut health because you can get like a good baseline of what people are dealing with in other areas of their body based on like gut, you know, experiences and stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you find a lot of your clients are experiencing uh, abnormal bowel movements, like either constipation or loose stools? Yeah, a lot of that, a lot of like bloating um, and what looks like weight gain in the gut, like, you know, the stomach area, but it's really like bloating and water retention and that kind of stuff. I get a lot of that. Yeah, it, it makes sense um, when you start looking at the effects of just all the things that the PUFAs and the, mm -hmm. all the inflammatory uh, things that people are consuming now, which <laughs> we were taught were healthy for us. Like I used to slam the the nut butters uh, oh, pretty yeah. hard. I think I was going through like two or three jars. It's like 60 bucks a week or something for like organic almond butter. <laughs> oh yeah. And then the almond milk on top of that or oat milk. I know how much you love that. <laughs> <laughs> right. So before we get into that, um, definitely want to talk about nuts and, and, and seeds and poofas. Um, how did you get interested in gut health? Did you experience issues yourself? Oh, yeah. Um, growing up, I pretty much always had a stomach ache and doctors would just say like, oh, girls get stomach aches. And that was kind of the end of it. <laughs> so um, as I got older, I just would experiment with different foods and things to just try to like diagnose myself as to what was going on. And I actually have a big family history of different kinds of gut disorders and stuff. So I was very, I guess, aware of what could be um, so I tried a lot of different types of like traditional testing and stuff and just could not figure it out. Um, I went vegetarian for like 10 or 11 years, um, on and off vegan. I did all the nut butter stuff. I did everything that they say is healthy, like all the raw salads and all of that. Um, and it just, it turned into like an obsession on holistic health because that was really the only type of practitioner that could give me some more answers. Like maybe it is nutritional related and not like a gut disease or something. And so I just got into um, like researching more about holistic health and I mean, chiropractic for gut health and all those kinds of things. And then I decided to go to school for it and um, it just kind of evolved from there. Wow. That sounds kind of like a similar journey. I was, I would say plant-based for, mm -hmm eight or nine years. And I used to have the belief that raw food was the easiest to digest because it was uncooked and it had all its enzymes. And my experience has been the exact opposite. Like for me, I found that cooked food digests so much better for me than raw food uh, in general. I mean, there's some exceptions. 
I experienced a little bit of that too. I actually worked at um, like a raw juice bar for a while and it was like mostly tailored towards like raw veganism and that kind of stuff. So I was eating a lot of that through the day, like during work and bringing it home and juicing really hard and all of that. And um, it helped with some things, but I definitely had the same experience. Like a lot of the raw stuff was um, causing gas and bloating and different kinds of things. So it was just confusing. because It's like they tell us this is what's going to be great for your guts specifically. <laughs> and then that's not my experience at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think in my my darkest days, I would get a a raw collard leaf, like collard greens, and I would use use that as the wrap around like a sunflower seed pate that I would make, and I would just cram all this stuff into it. And Absolutely, it was pretty harsh. <laughs> I would definitely bloat from that. <laughs> yeah, and I actually went to um, a holistic based school, and they actually taught a lot of things like that, like plant based nutrition and. Um, it was great for like just understanding different aspects of nutrition from a non allopathic view, but then a lot of that heavy like plant based stuff while I'm actively a plant based eater. So it was just like topped on topped and topped. And it's like, wow, I did a lot of damage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's there's a whole lot to unlearn because I uh, went to college for quite a few years and took some nutrition courses, and you have to unlearn both the conventional stuff, I mean, part mm -hmm. of it at least, and part of the alternative stuff that we've been taught. So usually we go through multiple rabbit holes, right, until we find balance. <laughs> yeah, it takes a long time. And I like to practice a lot of myself too, before I share anything with anybody. So I've done all the different kinds of diets for the most part in, you know, all the supplements and all the things just to see like, what's true and what's not. Mm hmm. Um, so when did you start working with, uh, clients to, to help people improve their, their gut health and digestion? Um, I think it was 2017. Um, I used to work, I was actually a hairstylist for a long time and, um, just talking with people a lot. And I had a passion for health then while I was going through school and I was still working with, um, salon clients. So I kind of started, you know, the process of getting comfortable with people and, um, just sharing what I was learning then, but officially I would say 2017, but, um, my husband's military. So we have moved a lot recently and just a lot of life changes and having my son and all of that. So, um, it's kind of been real patchy. <laughs> so consistently, at least within the last like two years, I'd say. That's awesome. It sounds like the most knowledgeable hairstylist because whenever I go and get a, <laughs> get a haircut, they'll say, you know, the small taco, oh, what do you do for a living? And I'll start talking about poofas mm -hmm. and animal foods and maybe liposuction. And they just, <laughs> the responses like, I get, right. <laughs> 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 they need a lot of help in those hair salons. I can tell you that. <laughs> it, well, the last hair salon I worked at was actually, um, it, it was a terrible salon, but um, I actually worked with two other like very health conscious people. Of course, we were all on the same like wrong health conscious journey <laughs> with plant based eating and all of that. But um, it was helpful to have like decently like minded people to communicate with while I'm going through school and stuff. So that was nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's awesome. Well, uh, well, yeah, we can start jumping into the the meat of the convo, everything that uh, people are interested in hearing. Um or at least your perspective and experience. Um, Cause I find this, this whole area of, can get really um, uh, just heated. Uh, even when I talk about gluten, you know, and I post pasta, people lose it and say, mm -hmm. Oh, I have celiacs and gluten's poison. And <laughs> I, I guess I kind of take like a bio individuality approach and um, there's, there's a lot of nuances, especially in today's world, right. Where, mm -hmm. It just every little minutia of detail matters and that affects how you digest and everything. <laughs> yeah, really everything. I mean, from how your food is grown and what you're eating it with and how you're preparing it and time of day and are you drinking water or not? And everything really pays, plays a role in your gut health. Mm -hmm. Um, Kind of random. Have you 
looked into uh, Adam Bergstrom's solar nutrition, like the idea of timing? <laughs> I have a little bit. He's got some really interesting theories on a lot of stuff, but I really like where he's at with some of this. Um, and actually, when I was in school, there was a girl um, that focused on like blood type diets and stuff like that. And part of that is also like when you eat certain things during the day, um, how they're grown, are they grown in sunlight or moon or I mean, it's really complicated and weird, but I think there's, I mean, for some people anyways, it might work. I don't know. Yeah, I think the things that blew my mind the most are, I think, eggs and potatoes are more nighttime foods mm -hmm. than most people eat those in the morning, I think. <laughs> I definitely do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think there's something to the blood type diet? I get that question all the time. I think, I mean, maybe on some level, because um, I don't know, I don't really know if like our bodies run differently on your blood type, you know, that's not definitely not my area of expertise. But um, I've noticed like, as far as like personality traits and things like that, or foods that people like, there's a whole list of like, if you're, you know, a negative, you like these certain things and nine out of 10 times, they're right. So I don't know if that really is a thing or it's just a coincidence that a lot of people with the same blood type have the same food preferences or what. I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I I know for, for sure I thrive on muscle meat. Like if I go a few days even without muscle meat, I don't feel good. So mm -hmm. that could be because I'm... Oh, oh, blood type. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. I mean, there are a lot of benefits to muscle meat in general. Um, so maybe your body's like, I need it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, I have your your Instagram pulled up here. And you have a lot of great posts, um, a lot of mm -hmm. free information that people can, can, can look at. And um, your latest one was five ways to support gut health. And you say, Increase fiber, avoid processed foods, eat fermented foods, eat a raw carrot daily, and take a probiotic. And um, I remember even as recent as a few years ago, I, I wasn't doing most of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, so eating almost zero fiber, no fermented foods. And uh, I was definitely feeling it. It's uh, it a pretty rough time. <laughs> <laughs> Especially coming off all those poofas, huh? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, because that's the thing with fiber, right, is that I think people don't realize that it actually has a hormonal um, effect, balancing effect on um, estrogen, right? Yeah, it really depends on what form of fiber you're getting. But as far as like the raw carrot, you know, that's going to um, grab the endotoxins, grab the extra estrogen and push it out. So your body doesn't really digest fiber. It just kind of moves through. And that sounds weird, but it's actually really handy in the form of a carrot because it's going to move through and grab all of those things, grab the estrogen, and then push it out for you. That's awesome. Yeah, a lot of people start on vitamin E, um, especially high dose. Like I experienced just crazy acne, and that's part of why I got into health with skin stuff. But mm -hmm. I just had this breakout for several months, and I just sweat in the sauna um, to work through it. But it probably would have gotten even smoother if I would have done fiber at the same time <laughs> as in the raw carrot. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so are do you ever have um, uh, clients that work well with, with leafy greens? Um, Cause when we get into fiber, we can really um, segment it by uh, fermentable and infermentable fibers, right? Yeah, definitely. So like fruit fiber and, um, vegetable fiber really aren't the same, in my opinion. <laughs> mm. And so what, what you would say vegetables, more fermentable and fruits and fermentable or? Um, I think like vegetable pro or proteins, vegetable fibers um, actually move a lot slower through your digestion system. Even if you're somebody that can tolerate leafy greens and spinach and things like that, um, it still moves a little bit slower because there's a lot more cellulose, like dense cellulose in the vegetable fiber, whereas fruit fiber um, is a little bit quicker to digest. So that's why like you know, fruitarians have to eat like 60 pounds of fruit all day because it digests so quickly. Um, but the fiber is still really beneficial for the good bacteria either way, fruits or vegetables. 
Um, but where vegetable fiber comes in and can be harmful, I guess, to some people is the histamine levels. So things like um, spinach are actually naturally high in histamines. And so when they start to slow down your digestion, the histamine levels rise in your gut. And that can just, that's a whole other topic that can come up with a lot of problems there too. Um, so you're getting like the benefit of the fiber that it's feeding the good bacteria, but then you're getting the higher histamine levels that can cause some people problems as well. Oh, interesting. Is that does that apply to a lot of other leafy greens as well, other than spinach? Or I think so. I think things like kale, like the darker ones, typically typically have a higher level of the histamine. Wow. Yeah, I, I noticed that's a a big issue with a lot of people, um, and I usually point people to to bioavailable copper to deactivate it. But I guess that's kind of like a long term solution, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to tell everybody like don't eat leafy greens because some people really thrive on them, but that's something to be aware of for sure. Mm -hmm. Ideally homegrown, right? Not like the Costco. Uh, <laughs> spring yeah, mix for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Those are definitely something that um, Adam Bergstrom's ideas might really play a role in. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's awesome. So so we could, I mean, just to kind of structure this, we could go through those. So we, um, talking about fiber here. Um, so is that something that people just have to play with, um, experimenting? I, cause I've done a pretty wild experiment where pretty much my only source of fiber was the raw carrot. And mm -hmm. I don't think that went too well, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> even eating two or three throughout the day. I don't think it was enough. Um, and so I find, you know, fruit, like I've been hitting the passion fruit and mm -hmm. the seeds in there feel so soothing on my gut. It's pretty wild. Passion fruit, I think, also even has um, like natural enzymes. So like a papaya enzyme or something like that, that can be really supportive for digestion. So you're getting like the good fiber from that, as well as the enzymes that help with um obviously digestion, but also help with like um, raising your stomach acid to a healthy level. So you're getting all kinds of stuff from that type of a fruit. Mm -hmm. So how do you know which, like in what context to increase fiber or decrease it? It's honestly trial and error, I would say. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you want to pay attention to things like your stool, like, is it, um, too thin or is it too hard? Are you struggling like with constipation? Um, do you have a lot of like gas and bloating after certain foods? Um, and then like the higher histamine foods like spinach and the dark leafy greens and um, even some like green teas and stuff like that. Um, if you're getting like allergic type reactions like rashes or headaches or hives where it's like seasonal allergies or something, that can also be a sign that the histamines are raising in your gut. So that can be maybe not a great fiber choice for you as well. Mm, interesting. Um, yeah, I haven't looked too deep into, into histamine, um, but that's involved in the immune response, right? And um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's funny in the, the metabolic community, like Jayton Miller on my show, he said he uh, pops Benadryl here and there. And that was a, <laughs> a, new, a new one for me. Um, you know, Ray Pete has talked about the antihistamines and how they could be uh, actually beneficial, contrary mm -hmm. to what people think. So I found that fascinating. And I did my own little experiment with the dye free Benadryl here and there. Mm -hmm. um, definitely a sedative, definitely effective there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Then a lot of people are more sensitive to histamines or antihistamines. Like that's another trial and error thing. So with that kind of um, experiment, you never really know what you're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, so let's see. Anything else on on fiber you want to talk about before you move on to the next next thing? Or I mean, I think fiber is definitely something that everybody should experience at some point or experiment with, um, because it's really the main um, source of fuel for the good bacteria in your gut. It really feeds off of the fiber. So it can actually, good gut bacteria can ferment the fiber within your gut in a positive way and feed it. So you're growing basically your own good bacteria. Um, but you have to find again, the right fiber for you, the right amount of fiber, like all of those things. That's a really good point because the carnivore diet, just like all the diets are trending <laughs> and, uh, 
their big message is, you know, cut out all plants. They're all you know, anti nutrients, you know, mm-hmm. lectins and oxalates and um, all these things. But they say, you know, you can't digest cellulose. And so therefore, plants bad. But that's a very, very like basic yeah. <laughs> way of, of looking at it. It is food, right? It's just not food for us. It's food for bacteria. So yeah, it's food for our bacteria. And that's really important to remember is that your bacteria live in symbiosis in your body. And so when you're not feeding them properly, you that's usually when you have like the bad gut things that we all experience. And we say, Oh, I just, you know, need more good bacteria. Well, you have the good bacteria, but you have to feed it properly. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, and they make um, neurotransmitters. And I mean, serotonin is a whole rabbit hole but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> contrary to what you hear in alternative health but it's um it's not necessarily a good thing to have a lot of it um but it definitely affects our mood right keeping those guys healthy definitely and that's like part of the um gut brain connection and um it's that's another controversial topic honestly because some people think that your um poor gut health causes the bad mood or that your bad mood causes the poor gut health. And so a lot of times, and this was my experience when I was going to get treatment for gut health problems, they want to put you on antidepressants or um, benzos and things like that to kind of calm your anxiety and stuff down. But those are really gut irritant medications for sure. So you're raising your serotonin levels and to try to get mentally happy, but that's really not the effect that it has on your gut. And so it spirals from there causing more and more gut stress and cortisol level rising and all of that stuff causing more gut stress, causing more gut problem. Mm, that makes sense. Um, and then you, your, your next one's uh, avoid processed foods, which is uh, <laughs> pretty kind of a no brainer, right? But um, I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I know when I go out and get like a cheeseburger, which I, you know, if it's if it's three dollars for a cheeseburger, I'm gonna pass. Like I spend a substantial amount, you know, and generally the quality will be better the more you spend mm-hmm. to a point. And yeah. <laughs> um, even with those buns, I just definitely feel like I almost need a cigar or something to like move it through. <laughs> it could just, you know, we all have those meals when we got to eat, and it just kind of sits there, right? But that's to me where maybe having supplements with you helps. Like I'll take vitamin E and. Shield mm-hmm. G, maybe some whole food C, and that seems to really help just get it digesting. <laughs> it's like a, you know, a, a bun or something that's not ideal. For sure. And that's like back to the gluten problem. That's something that I struggled with too, was like severe gluten reactions to like almost any kind of gluten. Um, but what really happens is the gluten in some people can activate um, the mast cells. So, like, um, immune cells within your gut. And that actually causes an inflammatory histamine reaction. So it all comes kind of back to that, like what's in the food? How does your gut respond? And that doesn't happen for everybody. So like the idea of like cutting gluten when you have allergies or something can be helpful for some people, not for other people. Um, But whenever that inflammatory response happens in the gut, it just stops digestion. So even if you don't have like a technical gluten allergy, you might be um, sensitive to the histamine levels in the gluten. And so that's causing the inflammation, it's slowing your digestion. And then now you have, you know, digestion problems and you have bowel movement problems because of whatever you ate with that gluten. Interesting. And a, a big issue that people focus on, I've been hearing this for maybe five, six, seven years is the whole glyphosate thing, which yeah. I think people could hyper-focus on. Like I think some, like Stephanie Seneff, which is pretty smart. I, you know, I've listened to a lot of her lectures and interviews and um, she's like a glyphosate expert, but it's not the end-all be-all to focus on that, right? It's just one piece. And if we're healthy, it's my kind of view that we can handle it if our liver is working and we're resilient. <laughs> <laughs> You broke up a little bit on that one. I got the end of it. Oh, oh, shoot. (laughs) I was saying with the glyphosate, glyphosate, like some people focus on it as the end all be all like that's Mm -hmm. if we can, you know, mitigate that or reduce that, then we'll we'll be all good. And that'll solve all our issues. Um, People even take like I messed around with, you know, those clay supplements um oh yeah things, those are so. coming back into popularity for sure <laughs> i never felt anything from that personally 
<laughs> I didn't really either. I did it for a second, but um, I don't know, like the glyphosate thing, it's definitely something that we need to be aware of, but it's not like this, the end all be all, like you're saying for sure, because I mean, we live under an acid sky. So everything that we are eating has come in contact with all kinds of different toxins. So if we just focus on the one, I mean, you're really missing the point, I think. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And I remember having um, Morley on, I think it was the second or third show and he brought up Zenef and he said that um, in a conversation with her, she told him that glyphosate will chelate copper down to a pH of two, I think, mm -hmm. even less. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like one of those other million things that will chelate our copper. Like, yeah, it's definitely not the only copper chelator. <laughs> no, it's not. So I would just say for the people that focus on that, then make sure that you are if you know, it's hard to avoid 100% glyphosate, you know, in your in our diets, just because where we live and all of that. So definitely focusing on um, getting copper in. I mean, even regardless, you have no glyphosate in your diet. That's definitely something that we need to be considering is copper consumption every day, because that's a vital mineral for your gut health as well. <laughs> Yeah. Have you looked into the effect um, of iron? Um, like my friend, colleague, Josh Rubin, has recently been putting out a lot of info on iron and um, how the um, what's called the enterocytes in the gut, um, they can get basically loaded up. Uh, like our intestinal tract can basically get loaded up with iron and that could cause a lot of issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's kind of one of those, um, at least as far as like supplemental iron. Um, and then if you're not like detoxing, you know, enough estrogen and stuff like that, all these things get built up and um, it, they definitely can damage the juncture cells in your gut. So that kind of leads you into leaky gut and stuff like that. So anything that gets um, backed up and loaded into your gut and your large intestine and all of that just really can cause so many problems. <laughs> mm hmm. I'd imagine lipofuscin too, right? I saw you did a few posts on that. Like that, that probably screws up the gut pretty good. <laughs> Big time. There's actually, um, I think Adam Bergstrom has talked about it a couple of times, um, brown bowel disease. It's like um, severe lipofuscin in the large intestine. And they say it's rare, but it's really not. Like if you can see lipofuscin on your skin anywhere, then you definitely have probably bowel, brown bowel disease. <laughs> Wow. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. It's funny how a lot of these statistics are either underplayed or overplayed. Like I always laugh at the <laughs> magnesium one. I think they say like 50% of the population is deficient. I'm like, no, it's almost a hundred percent. Yeah. It's pretty much everybody at this point. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting though, about brown um, bowel disease, because you think about how much aluminum and PUFAs, iron, and the excess estrogen that people have. Mm -hmm. And it would make sense that that would just get stuck in the gut, let alone everywhere else. <laughs> For sure. And at that point, like it's starting to atrophy the villi in your gut. And so that's actually um, the little finger things in your intestine that um, absorbs all the nutrients from your food. So when those become damaged or atrophied, now you have malnourishment. I mean, all kinds of problems from there. So a lot of people actually think that um, lipofuscin in the gut is Crohn's disease. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, that seems like an epidemic. I always yeah. get questions on, on Crohn's. Um, hmm, yeah, my friend Matt always says uh, a raw egg yolk like every hour. I wonder if it's the the choline in there to help detox that lipofuscin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely a supporter of the raw egg thing. I actually do a raw egg in my coffee almost every day for that extra choline and protein also. I still think that's gross, but maybe someday I'll come around. <laughs> if you put enough sugar in it, you're fine. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. Any way to get it in. That's... Yeah. <laughs> Especially for me coming off of like a, such a history of vegetarian and vegan culture, you know, I always still struggle with protein because I'm not eating like meat at every meal. I'm still not quite at that level. So I'm adding in like cooked eggs and raw eggs and, you know, tons of dairy and stuff as best I can to get that protein level. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. And, um, yeah, I think a lot of people are under eating that and if, mm -hmm. without sufficient amino acids coming in, you can't repair, right. Especially the gut. 
Oh, yeah, you need that for sure. And especially if you're eating a lot of like muscle meats, um, they are sometimes lacking in um, a complete amino acid. So for people that are coming off of a vegetarian diet, and they're only really focusing on muscle meats, you can be deficient in those amino acids still. So you want to make sure you're getting like bone broths and stuff like that. So you're really hitting all the markers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, bone broth definitely saved me. And um, it, it's nice that you can finally find uh, in certain areas store bought bone broth that's actually gelatinous. Yes, for sure. <laughs> but uh, most people, I think, have to make it themselves. But uh, if you really hunt, I mean, it took me years to find find one that actually jiggles and you're like, okay, this isn't just water that I'm drinking, you know, filtered water. Yeah. <laughs> I notice uh, sometimes the like um, frozen ones are, are much better quality than like the box on the shelf kind for sure. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's across the board for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then yeah, fermented foods is, is another one on your list here. And um, I think I stopped for several years. I, I used to make my own sauerkraut and um before then i was slamming kombucha and then mm -hmm. i got into jun and then i started making that myself and i don't know why i kept drinking it i think i just liked the flavor but i think it just made me worse <laughs> yeah i had a really bad experience with kombucha a couple years ago <laughs> what happened so i um before i really got into like the healing aspects of gut health as far as like feeding your probiotics and on taking probiotics and all of that. Um, I just knew like kombucha had a good source of natural probiotics. So I was like slamming it so hard and I had severe gut dysbiosis and probably a little bit of SIBO just from like putting so much good bacteria in there. And so the bad bacteria die off response was just so high. I broke out like everywhere for months. It took forever to get my face cleared up. Um, I gained some weight, like all kinds of things just from like hitting it so hard in my gut like that. At the same time, it was just really hard to come back from that. <laughs> wow. So you're saying it could crowd out the, it, it just creates imbalance with the, the species in our gut? It can. Um, really, any kind of fermented foods, you want to eat them every day if you can, every meal if you can. Um, some people are more um, sensitive to their effect on the body um, than others. So some people can drink kombucha all day long, and especially homemade kombucha, that's going to hit you a little differently. But um, it's really all about balance for gut health. So you don't want to have too much good or too much bad bacteria. And so when you're consistently putting in good bacteria, that's fantastic. But if you do it really hard, you know, all at once, um, every day you're taking, you know, four times the amount of probiotic or drinking a whole bottle of kombucha all throughout the day or whatever. Sometimes for some people that can be way too much good bacteria. Wow, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, <laughs> I experienced a lot of bloating when I was downing uh, kombucha in my raw vegan days. You know, I yeah. <laughs> have it with, with every meal or whatever and uh, wasn't working. <laughs> 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 it's great in moderation. I mean, any fermented food really you want to start slow. So a couple tablespoons to half a cup of just once a day would be a really great place to start for sauerkraut or kombucha or even like kvass or kefir or like any of those kinds of things. Um, you don't want to go too hard right away. And then if you have um, like an easy ease into it, then for sure you can have it at every meal, but you just want to kind of experiment with it. Mm. Are you okay with the store bought um, like uh, sauerkraut? Because I know some people are against it. They're like, oh, unless you make it at um, home, you know, you don't know the quality or whatever the strains or. Um, I personally don't do really great with ferments. Um, in small doses, it's fine. So I'm not going to go out and buy it. <laughs> But um, if I tolerated it fine, I would probably say, I mean, if it tastes fine to you and you don't get like a big bloat or anything like that, you're probably fine with it. Yeah, I started incorporating it after Morley talked about the vitamin C content. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's even possible, but I think he said one cup is like 600 milligrams of whole food vitamin C. Wow. I think it depends <laughs> maybe on what the ingredients are, but that would make sense. <laughs> right. Yeah, I was like, oh, no, how, how do people get their whole food C up here in North Idaho? And then yeah. I learned that little tidbit. I'm like, oh, it's probably ferments. 
like sauerkraut. <laughs> yeah, that's a really great way, especially in the winter. I mean, I'm in Florida, so I'm getting plenty of vitamin C all the time. But if you can't get like, um, you know, fresh fruit, obviously, but vitamin C is in everything. I mean, sweet potatoes are very high in vitamin C, um, even some in carrots, you know, anything like that. So you can really get it everywhere. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Potatoes are incredible. I think they get a bad rap because of the the starch, right? But um, mm -hmm. put some butter and salt and cook it well. And I feel amazing on potatoes and they really satiate me. I do too. I love a potato. And I think that you really should probably have some kind of white potato every day because on top of, um, you know, they're just metabolically supportive with the easy to, to digest carbs and all of that. Um, but they also are a good source of easy to digest um, or easy to use, I guess, fiber. So they're really good for um, the prebiotic um, properties that are in it. So they're going to help also feed those good gut bugs. Mm. Have you ever experimented with uh, like, what is it? Um, like cooking it twice or whatever? Or is it to make like the resistant starch and people get crazy with it? <laughs> <laughs> A little bit. Yeah. Like um, I make like mashed potatoes one night and then I'll do like... Um, potato patties or something the next day and butter. And sometimes there's a difference in like how my body digests it. But I think that comes back down to like, what kind of potato is it? You know, is it how um, stiff is it before you start? Like how ready is it to be eaten and all of that? There's so many ways you can do it. Yep. Yeah. I'm really excited to grow potatoes up here. Um, Cause I probably be way different from uh from store-bought the way that I'm going to grow them. <laughs> Yeah. Are you doing that dome thing? Yep. The geodesic dome. Yeah. That'll be awesome. Yeah. I probably don't even need that. I could probably just grow them outside. But... <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, eating a raw carrot daily, that was a game changer. Uh, something I learned about from Dr. Ray Pete. And mm -hmm. um, I think I used to just cut them up and throw them in my salad that's probably part of what saved me in my raw vegan days. <laughs> yeah, that's when I was doing it the most too, was as a raw vegetarian vegan, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that's because it's an infermentable fiber, right? So it's the safest, is it the safest yeah, fiber so it for can... people? With... Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, God. Yeah, it's infermentable. So if it does kind of... Um, like if you're eating it with a lot of things like in a raw salad that are going to start slowing down your digestion, it's not going to start, you know, rotting in your gut like everything else. And so along the way, it's also going to grab those endotoxins and um, excess estrogen and take it out with you. So you really get a lot of benefit from it. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that help your clients a lot with, with different issues? Absolutely. That's usually the first thing that, um, we prioritize because on top of, you know, adding in um, good probiotics and those kinds of things, you want to remove as much junk from your guts as you can at the same time. So you want to make this good environment for the new good bacteria to really thrive in. And so removing estrogen, um, especially for women, and a lot of the women that I work with um, either have like PCOS or have like just really irregular um, cycles and that stuff. So I've noticed that removing that extra excess estrogen and um, improving just the gut balance and all of that kind of at the same time really helps so many things. Mm. Do you have a, a certain time that you recommend they eat it and just, just once a day? Or I don't really have a time. I, I mean... I don't, I put a timer on my phone for myself actually. So I don't forget because <laughs> you get busy through the day, but, um, I just say whenever you can just a raw carrot whenever you can. And some people say like, cut it this specific way and make sure you have the apple cider vinegar and all these different things. But as long as you're just eating the carrot, like that's really all that matters. And then you can kind of add things from there. Yeah, I saw some people are just dipping it into uh, co coconut oil or <laughs> yeah. just like dipping it into a fat. But it's my understanding, I think the, the purpose of the raw carrot salad is it's not really the strips that matter. It's just having the that bile dump from like ingesting a fat like mm -hmm. coconut oil or olive oil. And that can kind of potentiate the effects. That's my understanding anyway. Yeah, I think it really depends too like on... Um what the rest of your day is like, like if that's 
the only thing you're doing, you're not really prioritizing protein like anywhere else in your diet, um, then for sure try to get something like that with it. But most people are having it, you know, in the afternoon or something, and then they're going to have like an adrenal cocktail later or a snack. And so they're going to get like some protein with it, or they've had lunch before that, or it's with lunch or something like that. So you're getting um, protein and stuff like that in other parts of your day that are going to really help that. Um, And I think that's also where it's important to remember that it can take, I mean, 18 to 24 hours to um, fully digest and have everything pass through your digestive system. So that carrot's still in there doing its job while you're eating everything else through the day. Oh, that's a really good point. Yeah, the the transit time, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, one of my, uh, this guy, Robert Kassar, I followed for years, he would say, eat, uh, I think it was like raw nuts or seeds, and then see how long it takes for them to show up in the toilet. And that shows like your yeah. digestive health. <laughs> yeah, even for some people, carrot, like I've had questions before, um, why am I seeing carrot pieces in my stool? Does that mean my guts are bad and you know I'm not digesting? Well, because we're not actually digesting the fiber in the carrot, some people can experience like an orange tint to their stool after that, or even pieces of carrot. Like my son, um, I've seen carrot, you know, in his stool before because um, he's eating so much of them and like he's getting all that stuff removed. And so the carrot fiber like grabs onto that. And sometimes you can see it when it comes out. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned the adrenal cocktail. This is something that I've been. So the adrenal cocktail, you can do so many different things with it. Um, I actually have a couple of different recipe styles on my Instagram because I like to change it up. But you just want to make sure you're getting um enough electrolytes like potassium and magnesium and manganese like all of those things um silica if you can get it um and you're getting good carbs and a little bit of protein it's kind of like a super food in a drink form so salt is definitely a must um i always like to do orange juice and i actually prefer um heavy cream and collagen in mine for protein but all kinds of other things i don't focus too much on the um coconut water because I typically also make a smoothie in my day with coconut water. So I'm getting it somewhere else. But if you're not doing something like that, then you want the coconut water for that extra electrolyte as well. That's awesome. Yeah. I've noticed in between meals, it's a strong effect and, um, the, the relationship between sodium, potassium and magnesium are really interesting. Mm -hmm. Like if you increase them all versus just magnesium, there's a definite, and I felt it, a definite um, reduction in like your baseline stress level. <laughs> yeah. And you're getting like the ability of um, like dual absorption where like you want, you know, this certain nutrient to help you absorb this nutrient and then assimilate it and all those things. So you kind of need a little bit of everything to do all of that. So if you're just getting the one, like that's great. You're getting your magnesium. That's fantastic. But you're not getting everything else that really helps your body use the magnesium. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Um, and then your your last point here is the probiotic. And um, that was a journey for me. I used to just go to the health food store and to the refrigerated section. And someone <laughs> told me the more strains, the better. So I'd buy, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> Garden, of, Garden of Life or whatever, 40, 40 strains. I was like, oh, this is awesome. And, I'd, <laughs> you know, I'd pour it in my ferments and, mm-hmm. you know, try to get a million strains in my body. Um and then I discovered spore-based probiotics. Um, I had like just thrive on my podcast a few times and um, I think they popularized them. And yeah. that that's a really easy way to take care of that endotoxin problem, right? Yeah, it can be because um, you want something that is just going to really boost your um, good bacteria in a positive way without, you know, too much like you can with some of the ferments. Um, your body's going to take what it needs and then flush the rest for the most part from something supplemental. So that can definitely be helpful just to have optimum gut health. And when you have good gut health and everything else is going to run smoothly. So it's going to start detoxing everything naturally on its own. Hmm. Have you ever told clients to take probiotics like with every meal? Because that's my understanding that if you, if you take it with a meal, um, then that endotoxin release, um, is really mitigated. Like the, the big issue is endotoxins, like the post right? Like after a meal kind of hit. 
<laughs> yeah, you definitely can. I think it depends on what probiotic you're doing because obviously not everyone is the same. So I think it's first important to make sure that you're taking either a liquid or something spore-based so that it can actually um, survive the stomach acid pH. So if you're taking anything that's not spore-based, not a liquid, um, it's not going to even make it to the intestines where you need it. The stomach acid is going to kill it. So if you're taking something that's just not the right one, it's really pointless. Um, and then some people have a problem with the cellulose capsule. So if you're taking one, um, if you're somebody that doesn't digest the cellulose capsule very well, um, and you're doing that before a meal, your body is kind of struggling to um, digest and assimilate that. And then you put the food on top of it. So that can cause slower digestion in some people. Interesting. So they might want to just open it up in their mouth or... Yeah, I've definitely had people do that with the um, like the Just Thrive in particular. I think that's a really great option because of the spore base. But if you're struggling with um, the cellulose, I have had people do that before and had a great success. But another thing you can try um, before or after a meal, which usually is what I really suggest more um, for at, like every meal type of thing, is um, digestive enzymes or even um, bitters. Oh, wow. Yeah. Those, <laughs> but digestive enzymes, I went pretty extreme. I would buy uh, like a thousand capsules and just literally take a handful. Um, I think I was doing that on an empty stomach because I was trying to get like a systemic enzyme effect, but uh -huh. I didn't really know what I was doing at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I like to experiment too, so I get it. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's a good tip. Um, just pop like one digestive enzyme, right? With the meal? Yeah, it depends on what you're taking. If you're doing something like um, like just plain papaya enzymes or even um, passion fruit or anything like that, I would probably take a couple um, because the dosage is going to be really low. And then being like fruit-based like that, um, it can take some time for it really to like build up in your body to start naturally doing the enzymes, but it does help with digestion. Um, bitters, I kind of prefer bitters over enzymes for most people because, um, they can be taken, you know, before, after, during, you know, part of the meal, whatever. Um, and the herbal properties just really help with like increasing your stomach acid and preparing for digestion. Or if you've eaten something that's, you know, just not having it, like your cheeseburger with the gluten bread or something, um, it would help like really, get your digestive juices going and help push that through and calm the bloating or acid reflux or whatever you're experiencing. That's awesome. Yeah. I'll have to bring my, uh, my mountain detox from Shen Blossom with me the next time I have a burger. <laughs> Just put that That's... and all your supplements in your pocket. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> to bring a fanny pack. <laughs> <laughs> Please do that. <laughs> That's a good tip though about the bitters. Yeah. I experimented with that years ago and um they say if you're drinking alcohol it's it's really protective to take bitters yeah because alcohol can also release a histamine response in some people um even like just red wine or anything like that so it wouldn't be a bad idea if you know you're going to be sensitive but you still want to enjoy a drink or something um to definitely mitigate that with the enzymes or the bitters mm -hmm. um so nuts and seeds we kind of kind of touched on it, but, um, those are, I mean, the, the big question I always get is, so why are they bad? You know, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll joke about oat milk on my Instagram or whatever. And they're like, so I don't get it. Why is it bad for you? And it's, um, would you say it's largely the, the polyunsaturated fat content that's inflammatory? Yeah, for sure. I mean, they have a lot of, um, positive properties, you know, protein and vitamin E and all those things, good fats and whatever, but it's really just um, the effect of the PUFAs afterwards. I mean, you really can't get around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And some people ask, you know, what if I make, make it at home? Like I even used to make my own soy milk at home, <laughs> like where I cook the beans and it was a, it was a long process, but uh, it definitely tasted better, but probably just as detr detrimental to my gut. <laughs> I mean, yeah, honestly, a poof is a poof, uh, whether you're doing it yourself or someone else's. <laughs> right. Would you say what what's worse, the, the nut butters, like the cashew butter, almond butter, peanut butter, or the milks? Or are they just destroy you in different ways? <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, I mean, it depends, because a lot of times, like, 
like kind of even with the greens conversation, like some people can tolerate um, different gut irritants because a PUFA at the end of the day is a gut irritant. And so some people can tolerate certain ones a little better. So then thinking about nut butters or nut milks, I think it really depends on what are the additional ingredients in the product. So like nut milks typically have a lot more things like thickeners and preservatives and all those things that are like enhancing the gut irritation effect. Whereas nut butters, a lot of times you can get really clean ones that are literally just ground up peanuts or almonds or whatever. And then you're really only getting the PUFA effect. So I think it depends on what you're eating it with and what the ingredients are that how it's going to affect you. Mm, that's a good point. Um, let me see. I'm wondering if we should jump into questions here. Probably we have a ton. <laughs> 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 um let me pull them up here what are your thoughts on parasites too in the meantime because there's different schools of thought some people think we all have them and it's kind of where i come from just mm -hmm. to a certain degree like maybe it's not the cause of everything but um do you think that plays a role or i think it does i think um I mean, everybody has parasites, everybody has yeast. I mean, there's really no way around those kinds of things. Um, and it's how I think we live in symbiosis with some of them, like um, like candida, it's not a parasite, but it's something, it, it's like a trigger word for so many people. And we all have candida, I'm just, we all have it. So it flares up based on how we feed it or don't feed it. And so the same thing can happen with some parasites and depending on where they are in your body, because you can have parasites in your brain, you can have them in your gut, you can have them in the tissues, all of that. And so depending on where you have them in the body and what type of parasite it is and all of that, they can definitely be a severe problem or they can be something that you can just live with and deal with. Mm. So what are your thoughts on candida? Like if someone comes to you and say, says, uh, what do you recommend I do? Should I cut out sugar? <laughs> lots of sugar, <laughs> lots of dairy, <laughs> all of those things. Um, I've actually gotten that a couple of times. It's not as bad as it used to be. Like before I was actually like working with people, I, that was definitely a huge problem. But um, I think people are kind of a little more open now to the idea that it's something that we have and it's like your, you know, your good gut bacteria that's more common now. So it's not so scary sounding, but, um, I mean, at that point, if you're already having like a breakout of candida, just try everything. So most people have good success with like raw cane sugar, um, because really candida feeds off of those types of carbohydrates. And even like, um, some of the ferments and fiber and things that we've already talked about, those things that really benefit the gut are going to feed properly your candida. It's going to be happy. Then your symptoms are going to disappear. Mm. Yeah. One of my favorite things Adam Bergstrom told me is uh, like a lady cured her candida with a, I think it was a week long haagen fast or something. I heard that. <laughs> I listened to that episode and I thought that was genius. <laughs> 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 right. I think haagen has gone downhill, but a clean one probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I really enjoy it. Like the plain vanilla because it's, you know, milk and eggs and salt, like all the things we need, but it's definitely not like not processed milk, you know? So you have that <laughs> level too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with the questions that listeners sent in, we got a ton on leaky gut and, um, just what's your basic philosophy on how to how to approach that? I feel like everybody has leaky gut at some point. So especially if you are someone who is currently or has had a high PUFA diet, you have leaky gut at some point. And um, really, leaky gut is just a um, Band-Aid term for any like gut problem. So IBS and Crohn's and just, you know, poor digestion or whatever. Um, but it's really um, any kind of damage to the gut lining. And so like PUFAs and just stress in general, like high cortisol, um, slow digestion. So things that come in our um, gut and like ferment and slow down, they really damage the junction cells of the gut lining. And so that allows toxins and parasites and pathogens and all of that to enter into systemic circulation through the gut lining. And so you experience it all kinds of different ways, depending on what's causing the problem and, um, you know, what you're eating that is getting into your circulation. 
So it's kind of a hard one to really work with because you have an array of different kinds of symptoms and a lot of different people. But really, that's why I take a focus on gut health with everybody because you know, we're all dealing with this kind of a thing. However, it manifests, if you're improving your um, good bacteria, you are strengthening the cell walls in the lining of your gut, then leaky problems, no, or leaky gut is no longer a problem. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> what about herbs for gut healing? Uh, if you've gone They're, down the tea, tea route? <laughs> yeah, actually, I'm actually an herbalist as well. So um, aspiring, I guess it's kind of newer, but um, there's a lot of different herbs that can be strengthening to your gut health, especially for women, like red raspberry leaf tea is not only good for like your uterus and your um, urinary tract and all of that, but it's really nourishing to the lining of your gut. Um, same with like dandelion, that can be really great for um, like stomach acid problems, as well as, you know, anything in the gut. Um, digestion. So those can be found usually in like any of those over the counter teas, you know, um, or like tinctures and stuff like that you can make with those kinds of herbs that are going to be really helpful. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah. And I noticed you have a, you had a post on, on CBD, and the endocannabinoid system. Um, st- stress can really um, impact our digestion, right? So cannabis could be a huge help for some people. Yeah, big time. So, I mean, stress is a whole monster in itself. And you have like high cortisol stress that kind of manifests physically. And then you have emotional stress that does all the same things. Um, And so using anything that's going to be anti-inflammatory, and that's really where like CBD or cannabis in general can be helpful. But again, that's kind of like a not as researched area. In my opinion, there's so many different kinds of plant matter, you know, on that that can be good, can not be good, depending on how it's grown and process and all that stuff. So I think for some people it works fantastic and some people it doesn't, but it's important to understand that we do have, you know, natural cannabinoids within our body. So that can be beneficial. That's awesome. Yeah. The whole stress aspect, I've experienced that before. Um, whether, I guess it's all connected, right? Uh, physiological, psychological, <laughs> but, um, for sure, we yeah. Just lose, lose our appetite for, for going through it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what about H. pylori? What are your thoughts on that? Someone asks. Well, I think that's like one of those. I mean, we make such a big deal about like every year when the spinach goes bad. You know, um, I think that if you have like a strong foundation of you know not eating pupas, not eating like gut disruptors in general, when you come in contact with those types of things, um, you're much more prepared to deal with them naturally. Mm, That makes sense. Um, What about chronic diarrhea? Someone asks how to deal with that. I would ask, is it, um, are you going through a period of high stress? Um, What are you eating? I mean, there's so many things that cause that. Um, It goes back to the PUFAs. (laughs) But I would definitely, as um, regardless of what your situation is, I would definitely start increasing fiber on some level. So whether that's just a raw carrot or doing things like pears and raspberries and um, that kind of fiber, because aside from its prebiotic benefits and feeding the good gut bacteria, fiber does help um, like bulk up your stool. So for some people, that can be really helpful if you're experiencing more loose stool. The more fiber you have, that can bulk it up and help you pass it easier or like manage it a little bit better. Some people have the opposite response. If you have too much fiber, your stool bulks too much, and then you struggle with constipation. Interesting. So it's once again, finding that balance. Yeah, for (laughs) sure. (laughs) Um, What about stool tests? I remember I did one several years back and it didn't help me at all. And it was pretty expensive. (laughs) Yeah, they're really... I don't know. For some people, I think they can be helpful because you can see different like pathogens and um, even parasites and stuff in your stool. So if you're getting, um, depending on what you're dealing with, if you're getting that kind of result, fantastic. But if it's just to see like, um, you know, food allergies and you can get like stool tests for your gut bacteria and that kind of thing, I don't really think that's worth it because it's hard to tell like, you know, like we talked about how long does it take 
you know, food to get through your system and all of that. So it really just depends on what you're testing for and what your personal like health goals are with that test. I haven't really had great, you know, luck with that kind of thing, but. Mm -hmm. um, we had a few questions on alcohol. Um, is all types of alcohol bad for the gut? <laughs> I mean, not really. I wouldn't say all types of alcohol. Like I know you're a fan of like the tequila for the parasitic approach and all of that. I think that's great if you're using high quality. Um, but some alcohols can release a histamine response. Um, grain alcohols can do that definitely, especially if you're sensitive to gluten. Um, I mean, and sometimes they can just slow digestion because it's more of, you know, depressant on the body. And so that can be a negative effect on gut health as well. Um, I think that's another like, listen to your body situation, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. I think definitely the wine and the the beers are tend to be more harsh, right? Than the clear alcohols. Yeah, wine and beer is going to be more of a histamine response pretty much for everybody, even if you're not like gluten sensitive or anything. Um, they just tend to be higher in natural histamines in my experience. So you're just going to have that um, inflammation response. And it might just be in the gut. It might not be everywhere where you don't really, you know, have hives or anything. So you don't realize that you're having that response, but it can cause like elevated cortisol because now your inflammation is higher. Mm -hmm. um, have you had people get off of certain supplements and see a benefit like, like vitamin D, for example? Oh, for sure. I did myself <laughs> big time with getting <laughs> off vitamin D. <laughs> But that's yeah, that one's pretty harsh. <laughs> it really is. And people don't understand like the hormonal effects of vitamin D, like supplemental vitamin D anyways, and how that plays a role in your gut health and your digestion and all of that. So yeah, I definitely if I have um, a new client or just somebody asking questions, I usually say stop everything you're taking except for a probiotic or an E or something like those kinds of ones. That's awesome. Yeah, my mind was blown because I was looking into calcification for several years uh, and I still am. And there's, that's a big, big rabbit hole um, that just goes on and on. But mm -hmm. um, the fact that vitamin D supplementation increases calcium absorption in the gut. And then you look at how like mountain Valley spring water and these, you know, bottled spring waters are trending. And you're like, wow, that's a bad combo. You know, it's like 200 milligrams of calcium or more in these spring waters that yeah. people are downing while they're taking vitamin D. <laughs> or they're taking a calcium and D supplement together. That's exciting. Yeah, just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just keep stacking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's like the zinc thing. Everyone thinks you need zinc, you know, to improve your immune system and all of that. And that's really the opposite. Right. Um, one thing I realized we didn't cover was, um, not having an appetite in the morning because that's something that's like a big misconception that I think we all bought into for years that mm -hmm. if you wake up not hungry then you're a superhero right you're like ascending you're turning breatharian absolutely su superhuman <laughs> especially for women if you're not hungry as a woman you're like amazing <laughs> And that is not not true, right? <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And that's, that's actually a really good indicator of what your gut health is experiencing. Because if you're usually if you're not hungry in the morning, there's a lot of things that can cause that. But when your stomach acid is really high, like if you're not um, really fueling yourself properly, your stomach acid will raise. And that causes like the morning nausea and not being hungry. And um, it's really a sign of stress. And the more you do it, the higher your cortisol raises. And it's like a snowball effect for everybody. Yeah, that was definitely my, my experience, because I was doing um, like, one hour a day eating window. And I, I think I worked down from like, four to six hour eating window to one hour Wow. For, for, uh, it was like six months or something insane. And um, yeah, no sugar, uh, <laughs> no animal protein. It took a while to bounce back. From yeah, that. I'm <laughs> sure. High poofa <laughs> consumption. <laughs> yep. Soy and beans. Mm -hmm. uh, but so if you have clients that um, don't have a morning appetite and they say, oh, it's so hard for me to even eat one egg. Um, I know I heard Ray in an interview a while back say that he just has milk and coffee for breakfast which is so contrary to which is insane because he's like in his 80s and 
generally older people from what i understand need to be more on it and and like um like my friend Josh said younger people can generally get away with liquid meals more. I've heard mm-hmm. him say before. Um, so that still blows my mind. I'm like, how is he hyper functioning on just liquids in the morning? <laughs> but, I mean, he's probably doing a lot of other things through the day, you know, to get him through that period. <laughs> right. But do you, do you think that could help with someone just if they're not hungry at all and they can't eat, like just to at least start with orange juice or milk? Or just get some protein or sugar, even if it's like a liquid form. Yeah. I mean, even for me, I sometimes struggle with hunger first thing in the morning or like being too busy, like as a mom and like working in the morning and all of that. And so um, sometimes I'll just start the day with like a super packed adrenal cocktail and that'll get me through for like an hour or two until I can make breakfast. Um, But just something to kickstart your liver because in the morning, I mean, your liver can only hold enough glycogen for eight to 10 hours. And so after you wake up in the morning, you're basically running on fumes. And so when you're not giving your liver something to start and your liver is actually a big component of your gut health and your hormone conversion and all of that stuff. So you want to nourish it all the time. So when you're not giving it something to start first thing in the morning, you're starting with a burst of cortisol. And so the people that get that extra morning burst with their morning coffee, it's not the coffee, it's the cortisol jump. Mm. That's a really good point. Yeah. And the adrenal cocktail, I, I really feel it when I take it early in the day and midday, because that's mm-hmm. really where those peaks in the bell curve of cortisol is, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a good tip, because I think um, what we're missing in this field is practicality. There's like this all or nothing approach that I think we all fell into yeah. uh, for a while. And life isn't all or nothing. It's like about adaptability. And so I really like how you're real and just, you know, if you can't eat the first one or two hours just because life, then (laughs) having this renal cocktail to get you through, that's a really good practical tip. Yeah, just something. I mean, I try to always keep my house stocked and um, I mean, between my husband and my toddler, we go through food so fast. So, and I live in a camper, so I'm always at the grocery. Um, But I always make sure that we have like enough orange juice, we have milk, we have like gummies that are fresh made or like um, cookies or breakfast cookies, like something like that, that's going to give you protein and sugar. So if that's all we can get in the morning is like a handful of gummies and an adrenal cocktail, that's what we get. And then I'll make a good breakfast. So it's, I think it's about knowing your lifestyle, what you are actually capable of doing. Um, And not putting that additional pressure on yourself because like the health expert said you needed a breakfast or something before your coffee. And that's actually something my mom and I talk about a lot because she's struggled with eating breakfast before coffee for a long time. And so she recently started making like breakfast cookies um, and then just grabbing those in the morning, like one before coffee, even just one little cookie (laughs) before your coffee is going to give you something to get your liver going. And then it's going to be more prepared to handle whatever else you put in it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And I think breakfast is a big confusing topic just in general. Like, um, I mean, just with the restriction of like, you you can't eat this and you can't eat that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, pork bacon is a poofa. So never eat it kind of thing, which I've never said. I just (laughs) don't eat it (laughs) every meal or every day, probably. But um, I'm actually trying to diversify my breakfast. Um, and just eat different things because just eggs, you know, and milk can get pretty boring after yeah. several weeks or months. And so uh, I found like beef bacon is pretty enjoyable and sustainable. I mean, there's nothing bad about it pretty much. So. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of ways to really get all the markers that you're aiming for for breakfast. It doesn't have to be traditional breakfast food. I mean, this morning, my son had a turkey and cheese sandwich for breakfast because he that's what he wanted. I knew he was going to eat it, so I made it. Um, and that's the other thing. Like with kids, people put a lot of pressure on themselves to make sure that 
um, kids are getting these certain things, these certain nutrients, and it has to look a certain way. And that's something that I've actually struggled with a lot too as a new mom, because my son had like severe gut damage right at birth. And so we've struggled a lot with getting that under control and gut damage in kids can look like picky eating. And so with kids that don't want to eat, you know, the eggs you make for them in the morning, you really have to find another source of whatever nutrient you're trying to get in them. And just however that looks, that's how it is. You got to get them to eat. Mm, that's a really good point. Um, and I wanted to ask you about um, eating at night. So just still on the timing thing, because I think conventional, and I hear this almost every day from like social media influencers, <laughs> <laughs> some of which are my friends and I, you know, just still love them. But, you know, that, that myth of like, don't eat, you know, four to six hours before bed or like make your biggest meal lunch or something and like your smallest meal dinner, which for me, it's kind of the opposite. Like I find my biggest meal is dinner and that's where I feel the best. And maybe it's just back to bio-individuality, but um, even eating directly before bed, right? Like what's your whole, what's your whole philosophy on that? That if you eat right before bed, then all of your energy is going to go to digestion instead of quote unquote healing or autophagy or whatever they say. <laughs> oh, man, well, this is a tough one. <laughs> um, as a woman, you know, I've always been told like, go to bed hungry and you're going to burn calories. You're going to wake up looking beautiful. <laughs> so that was definitely something. And I see that in a lot of my clients, like unlearning, going to bed with a snack, you know, eating right before or having a big dinner or something. Um, for me, I have less of an appetite earlier in the day than at the evening. Um, and that's usually when I start to slow down physically too. So it's weird how that all happens, but um, I prefer a larger meal at dinner. I make sure that we get some kind of bedtime snack for sure. Um, because again, your liver can only store glycogen for so long. So you need to make sure that you're fueling it through sleep because everyone talks about like all your energy, you know, is reserved during sleep. Well, that's not the case. You have to fuel the healing you have to fuel all the things that your body's still doing during sleep. And so you want to make sure that you're either feeding it a decent sized dinner or, you know, bio-individual like preferences and all of that stuff too. If you hate a huge dinner, just make sure you're getting something before you go to bed for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Or I've had it where just, I mean, I just recently moved in another life situation where life's not perfect, right? And I don't have a chef per, a personal chef yet. So it's like, if I don't have time to eat dinner, you know, eating is eating ice cream better than nothing. Or Absolutely. It's just fasting better. And for me, it'd be the ice cream. And, you know, Absolutely. I consider it a food, but <laughs> <laughs> I do too. My husband gets weird sometimes at night when I'm like, Oh, my son, you haven't eaten all the dinner, but here's a bowl of ice cream. But it really fuels sleep. It helps, you know, you're getting the protein, you're getting the sugar that your body needs, and it's going to fuel you through sleep and you get a better quality sleep. Like a lot of people wake up at two and three in the morning, because that's when your liver kind of crashes. The same thing, like during the day, why we need an adrenal cocktail, it's the exact same thing that happens at night, we need that fuel through the night. Do you guys ever put anything on your ice cream, like fruit or? I love fruit in my ice cream. I love strawberries in it or, I mean, really anything. My son loves chocolate chips in his ice cream for sure. So we do that now and then. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I still am on the reishi uh, syrup. It's uh, a pretty hardcore thing to do, but it just it tastes like chocolate, but maybe slightly more bitter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. That sounds good. <laughs> Pretty enjoyable. That's an expensive additive, but <laughs> <laughs> but worth it, maybe. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah, and then the the coffee thing, which we you kind of touched on a little bit, but um, you know, this is a, another huge misconception, and um, you just mentioned the cookie before coffee, <laughs> but um, you know, because I I show coffee on my social media every day, and mm -hmm. people are like, you know, I it gives me jitters or it gives me nausea or an upset stomach and my usual thing that i tell them is just eat a big breakfast or eat a big meal before your coffee and it'll be totally different um especially if you add maple syrup to it do you do you kind of share that philosophy or, or what what are your thoughts on that absolutely i mean i personally don't think that coffee should ever be drank 
black unless you're having um, a whole meal with it. Like that's totally fine if you're eating protein and carbs and stuff with your coffee. Um, and that's the way you prefer it. Like my husband loves a black coffee. Um, so, I mean, you just want to make sure you're eating something with it because coffee can be inflammatory for a lot of people. Coffee can be um, really tough on the liver if you're not mitigating some of the other properties with protein and carbs because coffee does cause a cortisol spike. Like that's just what it is. So that's why we get um, the high adrenaline and all of those things that you feel with coffee um, with the jitters and all of that. So a lot of times if you're feeling um, the nausea and stuff, it's usually like a high stomach acid problem. And then you're putting coffee on top of that. Um, that can cause nausea. It can be a spike in your hormones, um, cortisol and adrenaline and all that from the coffee also causing the nausea. Um, but you just want to make sure that anything, I mean, this goes for anything, I guess, um, even tea in some cases, um, like mushroom drinks, like those kinds of things, you want to make sure that you're mitigating the possibility of a cortisol spike with things that are calming in a cortisol spike. So sugar and dairy protein, like those kinds of things are going to be calming to your liver during times of high stress. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah. And if I'm ever stressed or underslept, I just take a break from coffee either for that meal or even for the whole day. Mm -hmm. And that feels really good to where I'm not addicted to it. I can, I know when to take time off if I need it, if my system's feeling weak. <laughs> yeah. People do get addicted to coffee, to the feeling of that high energy, but it's high stress. So like coffee has so many really good properties. Like it can be antiparasitic. It can remove, um, like endotoxins and things like that. So um, that's where the idea of like coffee enemas and stuff come because you're wanting to get that um, parasitic removal or whatever, like directly where you need it to be. But if you're just drinking coffee, you're getting the same benefit. But if you're adding that like cortisol spike with it, then your body's in stress mode. So it's not going to actually use, you know, the good properties of the coffee. Same with if you're drinking like junk coffee, like you know, you're not really going to get that great of a result. If that's your reasoning is these health benefits because it's junk processed coffee. So you're just putting toxins in because coffee is actually one of the most toxic drinks in the world because of the way it's processed. Yeah. Yeah. Starbucks probably isn't ideal, right? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> um, by the way, for our listeners, this is my first time ever in 140 episodes that my phone crash so i can't access the questions that was <laughs> so we're we're winging it but it's it's flowing so i have a few more questions for you okay you just, just wing it for the rest of this um so enemas you brought those up did you ever get on the enema train because i was uh pretty hardcore on coffee enemas for for several months and i think it helped but um yeah like you said i mean it's that's a big debate whether coffee you know, orally has the same effect as the other end. And some people say it doesn't because it's, you know, going through the portal vein and going directly to the liver. But I don't know. I feel it's pretty close drinking it. <laughs> I feel like it's the same if you're using like a quality coffee. You know, if you're using junk coffee in your daily coffee cup, then no, you're probably not getting the same benefit because by the time you've digested it and all those things, it's like brown water with toxins in it. But um, if you're using, you know, a high quality, maybe you roasted it yourself or whatever, then for sure, you're going to get that same benefit. It's the same as like, you know, the parasitic benefit of drinking tequila. You're going to get that same thing. Like you're not going to do a tequila enema. So, <laughs> Sounds like it would hurt. <laughs> yeah. I never really got into all that, though. I'm very thankful. Um, I mean, I've had to utilize that in times of emergency at like my worst gut health and I was like deathly ill. But um, I feel like sometimes you can cause more harm than good doing enemas or like colonics, like those kinds of things, because you're really disrupting um, the whole system. And like your gut is designed to be a sterile environment. And so when you're putting things in places that should be sterile, like your body has a system, you know, so it's designed to go in one direction. And so when you're doing it in the opposite direction, it can just really throw off the balance of everything and increase cortisol. You can remove, you know, more things than you want to like remove a lot of good gut bacteria and all of that kind of stuff too. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I recently was at a, a little dinner party and I met this doctor that 
runs a, a, a pretty popular clinic, Dr. Matt Cook, and we were talking about um, uh, ozone therapy. And I, I asked him about um, rectal insufflation of ozone. And he was not a fan, uh, except just in, in like an acute um, setting mm -hmm. because of its disrupting possibility, like you were just saying. So he was more of a fan of drinking the ozonated water. But I've been playing around off and on with rectal insufflation of ozone with an oxygen tank and not just ambient air running the machine and um, <laughs> pretty phenomenal. It's like a gas enema instead of a liquid with like the, uh, the O3. But um, yeah, I think that's getting into the realm of like extreme biohacking or, uh, you know, yeah, for sure. you know, context of what some, if someone's dealing with like a severe gut infection. <laughs> yeah. I think like, you know, bio individuality and all that stuff definitely plays a part in all of these things. Um, but I think that if you're going to do any of that, a coffee enema, ozone, like any of those things, I would honestly recommend um, in a professional setting if you're not experienced with these things, because like your gut lining and everything kind of in that zone are actually really um, sensitive and fragile, like especially the gut lining, it's very, very thin. And so the slightest, you know, stress can cause a problem with the juncture cells or all those things and lead to leaky gut. And so really quickly, you can have a negative effect on a lot of that stuff. Mm, that's a good point. Um, and uh, I want to ask you about gummies, because uh, I, I fell off the wagon with making them. I think it's so easy. And if you get, mm -hmm. I find like if I make them consistently, then it becomes almost like a meditation. It's just like second nature. Like I don't have to think about what I'm grabbing. I just yeah. get it done. But it's it's overwhelming at first, I think, for a lot of people <laughs> to, to make the homemade gummies. They're like, wait, why don't I just buy, I don't know, that just Haribo or something. Or <laughs> Oh, yeah. You miss kind of like the benefit or the point of what it is for sure. <laughs> I love gummies. I make them weekly, um, sometimes multiple times a week. My son loves them. My husband loves them. So um, I just always try to make sure I have like a stash of them in the fridge um, because they are easy. I mean, at the end of the day, they're one of the easiest things that you can do. Like they're faster than making cookies and you get the same benefit of protein and carbs. So if that's like your goal is to have like a quick, easy snack, gummies are the way to go. But on top of like the protein and carbs that you need, you're also getting a complete profile of amino acids if you use um, beef gelatin, which is my favorite thing ever. <laughs> so you're getting like the amino acids that can strengthen your gut, you're getting the protein and carbs that are good for your liver and energizing and all those things. So it's really great for like, just a quick like pick me up through the day or like, even if you're using enough, like I use maple syrup in mine as the primary sweetener. So if you're using enough, you're kind of like getting that um, sweet jump that you're looking for in a candy or sweet or something. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I've only ever used um, white sugar and just uh, cane sugar, but I, I should experiment with trying different sweeteners in there. I love maple. I have a much better response or like um, texture in mine if I use a maple instead of a powder sugar. Interesting. Wow. Have you ever screwed up a batch? Like oh, I noticed... Yeah. <laughs> like if you if you boil it it kind of becomes like you'll get that like hard layer on the gummies right oh my gosh I've had so many like weird things like we recently moved we moved into the camper we moved to a new state and so learning how to cook on a camper stove has been an experiment for me for sure and so I really had to kind of change um, some of the way I did the gummies because like you want to let the gelatin bloom in cold but you want to make sure like it's cold enough to actually bloom like your juice or water or whatever. And so I didn't have like the first time I tried them here in the camper, I didn't have my juice cold enough. And so it didn't bloom right. So then it was all really thick. And then I've had like clumps of gelatin and all kinds of things. So I finally have it down to a science here in the camper and I will not be changing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine a new kitchen, you have to relearn everything kind of <laughs> yeah like heat is different i'm on a um, gas stove instead of an electric stove so it heats differently i like it much better but it just takes some time <laughs> yeah um do you have a little rest like i have a recipe section on my site or do you have a post on it people could reference through i have um i think i have a reel <laughs> i know you love reels but i think i have a reel <laughs> of um a recipe i actually did um 
a recipe on gummies and how to incorporate like vitamin E and Shilajit in them because my son was really young and he just hated taking any supplement. So I was sneaking it in everything. So I did a gummies recipe for that. Um, but I actually have a meal plan and recipe book on my website um, for purchase. So it has like all my favorite recipes and gummies and stuff are included in that as well. Oh, that's awesome. Well, yeah, really, I love your balanced approach. And um, I think that's how we have to live, where it's um, just doing what we can, and being aware of all these things that you talked about, mm -hmm. um, but also just being adaptable and having snacks and um, just things to get you by until the next the next meal. Um, that makes sense. I know when I moved to this new property, I was living on gummies for like two or three days, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> it hits all the markers, so that's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 funny. I think I used to think that fat was the most important macronutrient, and then you know that shifted to carbs and sugar, and fats like actually the least. I mean, it's in context, I guess. It could be saturated fat can be helpful, mm -hmm. but. Um, it's definitely not the most important one. <laughs> yeah. And that's something I've actually had a lot of questions about because most of my clients are women. And so women, um, tend to focus a lot on like healthy fats, you know, avocados and nuts and those things. And, um, <laughs> it's really a challenge because when you're moving into a pro metabolic type of nourishment, I don't want to say diet, but, um, you're focusing on, you know, increasing proteins. Well, a lot of times that's protein and fat, like in high fat dairy and stuff like that. So a lot of women have um, like more than necessary weight gain when coming into pro metabolic eating, because you're also increasing a different kind of fat than what you would be having in other diet styles, you know, so you're increasing um, for some women, just excess fat on your body. And then you're coming out of like restricted diets and all those things. So when you start nourishing your body um, properly with like the nutrients that it actually needs, including fat, um, it grabs onto things and stores it in the form of excess fat on your body. So that paired with extra fat in your diet, it just can be a snowball effect for some women. Some people are fine. I struggled when I first started with all this stuff because of that, because of all the extra fat. Yeah, that's a good point. I know, especially women freak out about weight gain when they start incorporating all these things that you're talking about. And I mean, estrogen is pretty intimately involved in um, fat storage, uh, right? So just as they're taking vitamin E or doing the raw carrot or mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're really changing things at a deep level with their with their adipose tissue, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. People don't realize like what all gets stored in your fat. Um, and so, you know, having a certain level of fat is necessary for sure, because you need a place to store fat soluble vitamins and all of that. But if you're struggling with um, an estrogen problem, a lot of times that can look like heavy belly fat or anything like that. Or if you happen to have extra fat on you, and then now you're doing all these different things, sometimes, um, those extra hormones and stuff can just migrate to whatever you were storing. So it definitely can be um, a big period of learning and unlearning for women, especially um, doing anything for gut health or, you know, mitigating stress and improving metabolic function and all of that stuff. So you just really have to play around like with the fiber and with the fat and all of that stuff to find your right level of everything. Mm -hmm. Do you ever recommend um, different uh, tools or or devices like um, like sauna therapy or um, castor oil packs and stuff like that? I do. I'm new to castor oil packs um, for a bunch of different reasons, but I haven't experimented enough with myself. I do have some clients that have really good success with it, though. Um, and then saunas, I love a sauna or even just like... Um, high intensity workout that kind of gives you that same effect. You know, if you're, if you're good with, um, stress exercise, like I come from a background of high intensity, um, athletics. And so I'm used to like doing a lot of, um, endurance type exercises so for me like just spending a lot of time like getting hot and sweaty like as an exercise or outside or something kind of has that same sauna like effect where you're gonna um detoxify a lot of things mm -hmm. that's awesome um well this was a lot of fun amanda i appreciate you uh coming on the show yeah thanks for having me for sure <laughs>
yeah i'll uh i'll post the links below um so it's holisticbeat.com mm -hmm. if you want to check out her work and your instagram is holistic.beat uh b e uh, B E E T. Um, are those the, the, your main two things? <laughs> yeah, that's really all I focus on. I'm a mom. I don't have time for Facebook and all of those things. So <laughs> that's probably for the best. Facebook, like, kind of sucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gets really political, and uh, I feel like they're kind of behind the times on there. I don't know. <laughs> I know, and you know, I like the idea that you can post from one thing and it'll post to all of your socials, but like. Then you get messages and all that. I just can't deal with all that. So I'm primarily yep. on Instagram <laughs> and my website. <laughs> cool. Well, um, well, yeah, thanks so much. And uh, stick around as I close out the show. Great. Thank you. I hope that you gained some practical knowledge from that show that you can apply and test with your gut health. I've been on a fiber experiment and just increasing my fiber. It's interesting when you get into pro metabolic health or this whole way of living. There are a lot of views that I don't agree with, like the vitamin D supplementation view, uh, water being bad and fiber being bad. I think there's a lot of context with those things. And I think for a lot of people, high quality grains or bread can be helpful and provide another source of fiber. When I got off of the vegetarian and vegan diet, I went so hard on animal foods where there were almost no plants. And my only fiber source was the raw carrot. And that was an interesting experiment. I think it worked off and on for a little bit. But since then, I've incorporated multiple different other sources of fiber. As Amanda said, I think it's important to remember that fiber is the main fuel source of bacteria in your gut, good bacteria. And so you don't want to starve them out by going on a carnivore diet or something extreme like that. I really like what she said about balance because it's so easy to get into the extremes and trying to be perfect. And life is not about perfection. It's about failing, trial and error, and making the intention to keep getting better. We can really stress ourselves out trying to be perfect. And if we miss one meal, just the psychological implications of that can really send us into an emotional tailspin. But I liked what Amanda said about just quick options having available and if you're driving, just bring quick options with you. That's been a game changer for me living in Idaho where the drives are long and the trips are always uh, several hours. I definitely like having water with me, my MitoLife supplements, and some meat and fruit jerky. There's a company called Soli Fruit that makes mango and pineapple strips that are just dehydrated. And those pair really well with some dehydrated red meat, like venison jerky or beef jerky. And that's gotten me through some really hectic times where I just simply could not eat a meal because I had so much going on at once. I'll put the links below where you can check out Amanda's work. Her website is holisticbeat.com and her Instagram is holistic.beat. Definitely check out her post. She has a lot of free information. And she has that nutritional basics course on her website if you're interested in getting out of the keto mindset and all of the diet mindsets out there. And my website is matt-blackburn.com. I have my CLF protocol up there under blogs. I have recipes and all of my recommended products that I use. And most of them have discount codes attached to them. I recently added the Lucia Home Light to my website. This is something that I've used a few times at different health conferences or spas. Uh, some flotation sensory deprivation places will have them there. And I ended up getting one for my home because I really believe in the power of light to heal the body. And it 
has a lot of different effects depending on the application. This specific application is called hypnagogic light. And so it actually puts your brain into coherence with pulsing its specific frequencies and kind of going through a song of frequencies while your eyes are shut under this light. And I'll just put on some music next to me and do a session anywhere from five to 20 minutes. And it's really good up here in Idaho where sometimes it's overcast all day long, especially in the winter. So to get that huge pulse of light to my brain, it kind of feels like a massage. And one of my theories is that it's stimulating REM sleep, rapid eye movement, because your eyes will flutter naturally under the blinking lights. So if you have the opportunity to use one, highly recommend it. Or if you host retreats or you have a wellness clinic, then I would highly recommend you get one and share it with your clients. I think it's a really cool piece of technology that's really useful for brain regeneration. And you can find the MitoLife products over at mitolife.co. We actually just got the Pufa Protect back in stock. That's the mix to cofferol, vitamin E in a medium chain triglyceride MCT oil base. And that's a really powerful product to use when switching over from supplementing omega-3s or eating a ton of nuts and seeds or restricting carbs or really just being a human being that lived through the iron fortification program because everyone has lipofuscinosis from the exposure that we've had to PUFAs, iron, aluminum, and the resulting excess estrogen. So a lot of people are loving that product. They're feeling the internal sunscreen benefits of it. A lot of people say they can't burn in the sun if they take vitamin E consistently. My big tip with this, especially if you're sensitive to MCT oil or you haven't consumed it before, is to take it with your biggest meal. Because each capsule contains a significant amount of fat, and that could be too much for a lot of people on an empty stomach. It can cause die-off if there's pathogenic bacterial overgrowth in the gut. MCT is a really effective way to clean the gut, and it's also a great energy source. But it could be too strong if you've never taken it before to do it on an empty stomach. So I just recommend take it with a big breakfast or a big lunch and see if that works for you. And as for the rest of the products, we're working on getting back in stock with the Panacea, the Purely K, Dissolve It All, and all the other products. Stay tuned on the Instagram MitoLife. That's where we announce uh, updates on when the products will be back. But I appreciate your patience. Um, for now, whenever a product's back, I recommend just getting a two or three month supply if you can to hold you over till the next batch. So thank you all for your support. I release a new episode every Friday. Stay supercharged.